we are going to have our previous chair, Andrea, start us off for the presentation in this section. It's going to be a 15-minute presentation about investigating the presence of non-native garter snakes on the island of Newfoundland. And so if you'd like to share your screen, Andrea. Um, investigating the presence of garter snakes on the island of Newfoundland, which is research that I'm doing with uh, Dr. Riley, Dr. Baxter Gilbert, and uh, Dr. Litzkis. Um, so um, we'll start by talking a little bit about um, invasive species. So there are major contributors to species declines. This is just some data from the IUCN um, on animal declines uh, or threats to animal species. And this one that I've indicated with a green arrow here is uh, named species. And a lot of the time when we're talking about named species, we're talking about um, invasive species. Uh, and then this is data that shows um, extinctions caused by named species. Um, so the dark purple bars here are um, alien species, so in invaders. Uh, the sort of medium purple is is a combination of alien and native species, and then the light purple is is uh, native species. So, as you can see, among named species um, that contribute to extinctions, generally it's it's uh, it's non-native species kind of across the board. <clears throat> um, so they do that by increasing predation pressure on native species. So a good example of that is the um, brown tree snake, which is here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, the brown tree snake was introduced to Guam and basically ate all the birds. Um, so that was not great. Uh, they also increased competition with native species. So this is a, a Burmese python here in Florida. And like in addition to eating everything when they were introduced, um, Burmese pythons also increased uh, competition with um, like native snake species and uh, and um, like other other reptiles. And by doing that, they disrupt uh, food webs and, and ecosystems. So it's not great to have those things happening um, when you have an invasive species. So what makes a good invasive species? Um, there's a sort of suite of characteristics that are common in really successful invasive animals. Um, not all animals have all of these characteristics, but you usually have uh, a few of them. Um, so association with human populations is, is a big one. Um, high propagial pressure. So that means like introducing a lot of individuals at one time or sort of continual introduction of, of individuals over, over a long time period, but basically like a lot of individual animals in one area. Um, high vigility. So this basically means like ability to kind of move around in the environment. Um, so animals that are more vagile can move around more easily and they tend to be more successful invaders. Um, high fecundity. So having a lot of babies. Um, means that you're probably going to be uh, fairly successful as an invader. Um, flexible habitat use. So the more habitat types that you can exploit, uh, the better you're going to do. Um, diet plasticity, again, so the, the more food resources you can exploit, the better you're going to do. Um, behavioral plasticity. So um, being able to adapt your behavior at the individual level uh, when presented with a new um, habitat is a really good uh, indicator of invasion success. Um, and then certain behavioral traits like boldness, aggression, neophilia, exploration, which basically means like your inclination to explore the environment and, and take advantage of new resources that, that you might encounter um, are really good indicators of, of being able to, to invade. Um, so getting into the system that I'm studying, Newfoundland, which is historically snake free. Um, in 2010, there was a, a, a gravid female garter snake that was found in Western Newfoundland. So in uh, the St. David's area, which is this yellow diamond here. Um, and then in 2015, there was a garter snake that was found in Southlands, which is um, a suburb of St. John's. Um, and then uh, in 2018, there was a, a garter snake also found in, in Middle Arm, which is this uh, sort of up in the north-ish part of, uh, of Newfoundland, which is that third um, diamond. Um, so this is not a lot of sightings over, you know, a long period of time, but it indicates that there are snakes there. Um, and we're interested in like, where exactly are they? Um, and how long have they have they been there? So we have some very, very general ballpark uh, information about that as of last year. And then we've expanded this, which I, is what I'm going to talk about. So to kind of answer, try to answer these questions, I made this poster and I put it on every um, outdoorsy looking Newfoundland based uh, Facebook group. Um, and just ask people, have you seen a snake? 
Um, and then I also directed them to this uh, other Facebook group that I made, um, Newfoundland Snake Sightings, where I asked people to um, report on on whether or not they've seen a snake. And I got a huge response. So, um, and and the responses ranged from like people taking a, you know, posting a picture and they're like, I took this picture at 2 p.m. on whatever, September 22nd, 2021 in my backyard. Um, so very specific, uh, very um, um, easy to confirm that it is in fact a garter snake. Um, and then uh, that sort of ranged all the way to, you know, somebody saying somebody, my my grandfather's friend saw, thinks he saw a snake maybe at some point between 1950 and 1955 uh, in the English Harbor West area. So like very difficult to confirm um, not and not a lot of specifics about time or location. So there was a very broad range of um, information that was given here. So basically this increased um, the locations of sightings uh basically across the island so all up the the west coast um a couple more on the the, the sort of northern ish part um more sightings on the avalon and uh this one we're actually there were two sightings um reported down uh in this area just the english harbor um harbor breton area <clears throat> so what i did is i got in my little car and i drove to newfoundland last summer um, and then I just like drove around the province uh, investigating these areas where people had reported snakes uh, that had been seen and then trying to talk to as many people as possible about um, whether or not they had ever seen a snake, if they had pictures um, and what information they could they could tell me about that. Um, so, yeah, these are just some of the places that I went to visit. Uh, two of them were um, snaky. So uh, not exactly here, but I did find snakes in uh, Middle Arm and St. David's. I didn't find any snakes in English Harbor, but um, it's really pretty. So there's a picture. Um, so we found quite a few uh, locations where where snakes were, or we got a lot of roadkill anyway. Um, and we sort of confirmed that uh, snakes were present. Oops. There we go. Okay. So caught uh, snakes in um, St. David's and Robinson's, which are both covered by this red diamond here, um, caught a snake in middle arm, um, had confirmation, like photographic evidence of snakes from uh, Trip River and Deer Lake, uh, which are there, um, photographic evidence of a snake from Virgin Arm. Um, and then actually during CHS in Ottawa last year, I got an email from the wildlife department that they actually found a dead snake on the road um, in Clarenville, which is here, which is really interesting because that's sort of a new location um, for snakes to be. So that's kind of cool. So that's kind of addressing that first question, like, where are they? Um, but then, like, how long have they been there? It's the other question that that I'm sort of interested in in, in uh, immediately. Um, so I keep touching this. There we go. Um, so we have this article from 2010 where the snake was found. Uh, she was gravid. Um, she gave birth uh, to little snakes, which you can see um, here. So, like, obviously they were breeding at in, in 2010. Um, and that was kind of at the time that I started this project, that was like the earliest actual confirmed record that we had of, of snakes being in the island. And again, I've talked to people who have said that they've seen them or, or that somebody has seen them, um, previous to that, but I didn't have any, um, like really confirmable, um, evidence. But then I was talking to a librarian at the Munn archives and she dug out this article from the Osprey. Um, which is this one from 1974, and I'm going to make it bigger um, and highlight the important parts. Uh, so on September 10th, 1973, uh, a, a naturalist um, who was visiting uh, Mun found a garter snake uh, in Kidiviti, which is which is around uh, near St. John's it's on the Avalon. Um, so that's different. Um, so basically what we've kind of figured out from this is that garter snakes are established in Newfoundland, um, just based on the, the fact that they're breeding um, and the, the sort of the volume of road kills that I, that I uh, was given um, this summer. Um, snakes are also more widespread um, geographically and have been on the island kind of longer than, than we thought. Um, so next steps to go from here, which will be my PhD research, um, is figuring out where they came from, um, how they're impacting the ecosystem, and how they adapted to their their new invasive range. Um, so getting into this, we kind of can ask these questions about whether a garter snake might actually be a good invasive species. So does it, how many of these boxes does it tick? Association with human populations, not really, kind of. So where I tended to find snakes was around um, human 
habitations. Um, so I, I think they might be using like foundations, old wells, uh, various sort of artificial structures, maybe as hibernacula, but they're not really associated with human populations in the way we think of like a cockroach being associated with human populations or like a cat. Um, so that doesn't really tick that box. High propagule pressure, we don't know. So uh, that's one of the kind of unknown um, elements is like how many garter snakes were introduced, how often they're being introduced, uh, et cetera. High vigility, not really. They don't tend to move super far, or at least the maritime garter snakes don't, which these appear to be. Um, high fecundity, yes, they have a lot of kids. Um, flexible habitat use, they're, they're habitat generalists, uh, they're diet generalists. They probably have plastic behavior. So some of the, the recent research on garter snake behavior that I've seen has suggested that they do. Um, and then we don't know if they, they, they tick off this box about having these behavioral traits that are typically associated with, with um, invasion success. So those are kind of the, the next steps that I'm going to be doing are kind of going to be trying to answer, answer some of these unknowns. Um, so the, the applications for this, the, the sort of most immediate application is, is management for, for the Newfoundland government. Um, so basically figuring out like, does there need to be a management plan? So that's going to be, um, when we're looking at the diet of, of, uh, uh, garter snakes, um, what they're eating on, on the island. That's sort of that project. Um, if they're just eating uh, toads, which this is what's happening in this picture from a, a Newfoundland snake. Um, if they're just eating toads, toads are also uh, invasive there. So um, probably not a big deal. Um, if they're eating other stuff, which they very well may be being uh, diet generalists, um, there might need to be a management plan uh, in place for the species. So, and then if so, what would that management plan look like? And that's gonna take uh, information from like, where did the snakes come from? So if we know where the snakes are coming from, we can sort of help uh, inform um, what a management plan would look like for those snakes. Um, sort of broader ecological ap applications is like, what are the implications of garter snakes being introduced somewhere else? So we know that there is another introduction of garter snakes uh, in Grand Manan, which is this little island off the coast of New Brunswick. Um, and then maybe, I mean, who knows? Things get introduced to places all the time. What are the consequences if potentially if garter snakes are introduced um, elsewhere and, and what might be the consequences for, for um, the ecosystem on Grand Manan. And then finally, the really broader sort of theoretical uh, implications are like looking at how do garter snakes fit with um, other species that are that are invasive, like what characteristics do they share with other invasive species and what does that tell us about how species become invasive? Um, and also like this is a pretty early um, early stage in an invasion so it would be kind of interesting to look at like what how how this maybe changes over over the next couple of years and how it's changed um from when they were first introduced um yeah so that's it thanks to all of these lovely people and uh i will take uh i'll take any questions that people have i'll bring the yeah, thank you very much, Andrea. Super interesting. Um, and we do have a couple minutes for questions. I think as you were showing your slide of the garter snake eating the toad, you got a, a comment in the chat from Leslie, cool beans. Uh, <laughs> probably did not win here as the, the primary food. Yeah. Like amphibians and invasive worms. And mm. then we do have a question. Uh, did you use iNaturalist for finding snake observations? So that was sort of the first, um, the first step was, was going on iNaturalist. And I think uh, at the time that we started this project, there was one observation of a garter snake on iNaturalist. And I think now there might be two. Um, one of the things that I've been doing, I made like a, a, a sort of digital workshop, I guess, or like a I made a PowerPoint and I put it on Facebook and I was like, this is how you make an iNaturalist account. And this is how you post things to iNaturalist. And we would really appreciate it if you see a snake, if you could put it on iNaturalist. And that hasn't really seemed to do anything yet. But um, I think that's that's something that I'm going to try to do uh, this summer. So I'm going to be hosting sort of meetings and workshops about um, garter snakes and other invasive herpifauna on on the island. And like that'll probably be probably be part of what I do is like a little bit of coaching. Um, on like what iNaturalist is and like how you can use it and why it's important to use. Um, and then I'm also like any sort of like NGOs that I've been talking to in Newfoundland that are hosting a bio blitz. I'm like, yes, please, I will come do that and like preach the word of, of uh, iNaturalist to, to, to people. <laughs> no worries. And uh, if you want help with, I'm sure you're connected with the Canadian Wildlife Federation that one of the leaders for iNaturalist. Uh, we had someone do a would love presentation. To actually, if you have like an official yep. um, workshop, that would be great. Yep. 
this is really summarized in the title um and just the concept of damsel frogs which are the first year um the the yearling leopard frogs that haven't matured their ovaries in their first year while the males the yearling males very largely have matured to the point where they have enlarged um thumbs and and the idea is that these juvenile females or not i got yearling females spread out across the countryside and um and benefit from the fact that there aren't the other age and sex classes um uh, um around because the males the mature females are in the breeding on uh, breeding water bodies um breeding and and so this starts out with a big event in 1999 where we had a real drought all through the um the spring breeding season and you know here we had the last snow in march and then a little rain on the second of april and then there's no rain in my records um until the 7th of may but bef before it rained um Alita and our daughter were coming back from a meeting in Brockville and they came up the the branch road from North Augusta to South Branch which where the road parallels the South Branch of Kempville Creek and and there was this huge movement of leopard frogs across the road and um and our daughter Jennifer and I went out and scooped frogs up and and I'm just going to show the my my paragraphs summarizing the collections of road kills um but but this is the kind of data that we gathered and we have snout vent length for all of these um and there's the uh, there's the second collection then on the 7th of may it rained and um and there was a smaller but still continuing movement and on the 5th of May, 68% of the frogs that, that were, were sexable were yearling females. And on the 7th of May, 44%. And, and, and the problem here is, is that you can only really sex, for, for the small frogs, you can only sex the ones that are sort of more than... 52 millimeters snout vent length because it's a about a 52 millimeters that the uh, the males thumbs start to enlarge and and you can say that they're males but um but below that size um they have to be road killed so you can look at the gonads to, to sex them so there's this all this amb ambiguity in what i'm going to be showing you and also this is all very texty because I oh, didn't manage to get around to doing the graphics. And and then on these these frogs that were road killed, um, a lot of them had beetles in their stomachs, bugs, the whole range of of invertebrates from um, from but largely beetles and and some um, other arthropods and and some slugs. And so the rest of this is going to be about a pond that's about 100 meters off to the west of this sign for the, the uh, and coming into the, the village here. Um, so, so Bishop's Mills is, is a hamlet um, on, on the Smith Falls limestone plain. And we moved here in 1978 so that I could go into the museum with Francis Cook and and I'm sort of following Francis's trajectory of of settling down to study the animal that I did my thesis on geographic variation um, on and and looking at the life history in various ways so so here's a photograph of me and Marigold the dog in the pond that I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this which I dug in 1983, and it's 
it's very overgrown with um with reed canary grass and various species of buckthorn and 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 this one of the things that sort of predisposed me to um to to think about the pursuit of food in the movements is is Dole's spool thread study of the summer travels the leopard frogs where he found that in the summer the leopard frog has a little form that it sits in and and then when it rains or when it's moist it goes out and sort of a walkabout and and circles around and and feeds and then comes back to its form so that the the movement is moisture dependent either dew or um or or rain and and so there's lots of other in our the other things we've done around here there's lots of other species of frogs that seem to have food motivated uh movements green frogs and leopard frogs that i mean green frogs and bullfrogs that leave the water bodies and go hundreds of meters away um in various seasons and so this is samples that i'd taken in in the 1990s for um for the story lab uh where i caught the frogs around the pond and you can see that that the majority of them are labeled with female thumbs and and if i were to go into this more detail i could separate out the ones that were small enough that you couldn't tell whether they're male or female and then the ones that were larger yearlings where you could but but they're all predominantly um have female thumbs and here's just some pictures of little leopard frogs from Bedwigny so you can see what we're talking about and and so the what I what I do is I walk around the pond and count and try to identify how many frogs jump in and, and as I say, there's no 21st century collections because the more I read about where frogs move, how they move, and where they hibernate, the, the more worried I get that catching them is going to convince them that the place that they're in isn't really a good place to be, and so they'll go off to somewhere else. And um, so... So here, starting in 1999, are the number of circumperambulations around the pond. And um, and you can see there's a lot of very, these are the largest counts for each year. And and you can see that it's, it's very variable, but of course it's chancy into when I go up to the pond and, um, and then what the whole population is and, and what the direction of the movement is across the landscape. And and you can see that in 2005 was our highest count of 106 um, on the 9th of May. Oh, here. Um, and this this shows how many visits I was making um, to get that largest number. Um, and and. So I, I both go up to count the frogs around the pond and and also this pond has a a very sketchy population of Ambistoma laterale um, that breed there. And and so I run a minnow trap to uh, to see what the salamanders are doing. And and this is the, the account of the 10th of May, where there are 70 yearlings and some adult males um, around the pond. And they're starting from the, the 106 that I'd seen the day before, they're starting to disperse out into the fields. And, um, and, and as they're doing this, they stop jumping into the pond when you walk around the banks and, and they will jump away um, from the pond towards the fields. And then this is the rest of the year where you can see the numbers are going down um, from from 70 down to to just one or two 
um, as we go through June. And then here's the uh, some more counts um, from 2006 to 2012, and and there's there's sort of a decline through this, and I haven't worked this out in contrast with the the counts from where we do the streets or the transect that we have in the village and count frogs on the road. But uh, many of you may be familiar with this publication about the, the crash that um, we found when we looked at the numbers seen on the streets. And this is, isn't at the pond, but this is about 300 meters away. And, um, and whether this is associated with a really bad winter for anoxia in the hibernation, um, hibernation in the stream or something else, we're not really sure. But um, you can see after the decline, we've had hardly any frogs um, around around the pond until this past spring, when we actually had eleven, uh, which was very comforting to find after all these years of of hardly any. And and last summer we had fair numbers of frogs around the village, so we. We're anticipating that we'll have more um, this spring, and so this is the, the this title is is taken from a verse of a song that I wrote for our daughter on her sixteenth birthday, where um, where I talked about the, um, the the whole life history of the leopard frogs and with with inviting her to take me out to places where we'd gone together so it's take me out onto the branch road as a hard may drought is watered and the damsel frogs flee the foodless shores for the fields and their grasshoppers and and this is the second of the verses that i've i've expanded the first was i looked at arrival time in the village and found that when I averaged the arrival time of the juveniles, um, that they came out exactly at the 1st of August, which was our traditional guess for the date when they arrived. And, and, and one of the things that I've learned about the frog movements generally, and I've given some talks about this at, at various meetings and the changes in the, the spring movements of the of the um, the reproductive frogs just being you know move being in different places at a scale of kilometers depending on how wet the uh, how wet the the spring is that that the movements are not sort of the fixed um, the fixed routes that a lot of salamanders and toads and turtles take. Um, in their reproductive movements, because it's determined by the whole character of the landscape and the population of the frogs and a whole lot of other things. And it's going to have to be, if we're going to have mitigation, it's going to have to be a different kind of mitigation. And and in one case, Elsa's pond that I dug, and I had no idea I was doing this, but before we dug the pond, we had Ambistema on the road near the pond going um, going further east. And since I dug the pond, we only realized this at about 20 years later, but since I dug the pond, we haven't had any salamanders on the road and they've seemed to have stopped at the pond to breed rather than going further on. And this is this is one thing that could be done is to put little patches of useful habitat in place to uh, to prevent further migration. And and I'll just remind everybody that between our data and Francis Cook's data, we have two parallel, non-overlapping but adjacent systems of herpetological data from Granville County to half century tradition and 
if anybody wants to mine data or if anybody wants to continue some of these projects for a few years as a master's project, uh, we can provide we can provide room and board. So let us live here in Bishop's Mills, in the Merricksville Quadrangle, in a land that's shared by man and frog, garter snakes and blandings turtles, with joint sovereignty acknowledged. And there's the logo of what we used to be. Okay. Thank you so much, Fred. We always appreciate your songs. Uh, you're getting all some praise in the chat as well. Thank you so much. And we will move on another 15 minute presentation about mitigating turtle vehicle collisions in the United Counties. Yeah, so like Hannah said, my name is Katie Black. I'm an ecologist with Blazing Star Environmental in Ontario. And I'm excited to talk about a road ecology project that we did last year with the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville and the Algonquin to Adirondack Collaborative. So to give some background on Algonquin to Adirondacks, or A2A. Uh, it's a region, but it's also an organization, a not-for-profit. So the A2A region is represented by a unique and diverse habitat link that connects Algonquin Park to Adirondack State Park, so from Ontario to New York, through the Frontenac Arch. And the Frontenac Arch in the A2A region as a whole is one of the last large-scale intact forest and wetland linkages left in Eastern North America. And some people say it provides the best remaining potential for wildlife movement across the Great Lakes St. Lawrence system. But one of the big challenges to maintaining this landscape connectivity in the A2A and Frontenac Arch region is the presence of major roads and highways like Highway 401 on the Ontario side of the St. Lawrence River. Um, and these roads, they pose a substantial barrier to wildlife movement they're a major cause of wildlife mortality. And with animals trying to cross these roads, they also pose a big threat to vehicle traffic and human safety. So a single survey of about a 60 kilometer stretch of the 401 from roughly Gananoque to Brockville in June of 2017, a single sweep found almost 700 dead animals. And that's a really big number, but it's also a really big underestimate considering how many animals get smushed beyond recognition or just go undetected, especially the small ones. So creating structures for animals to cross over and under these roads is a pretty urgent issue within Canada, but also has international implications considering the connection to the US in this area. So we've been working with A2A, the organization, to come up with a pretty bold mitigation strategy to restore landscape connectivity in this region. And this work with A2A has led to our involvement in the road ecology project that I'm talking about today in the United Counties of Leeds and Grenville. So the county falls within the Frontenac Arch and uh, plays an important role in maintaining that broader landscape connectivity. And it uh, fronts the St. Lawrence River, so it's an international boundary between Canada and the U.S. here. And the thousands of islands along the river here act as important stepping stones for wildlife movement along the Frontenac Arch from Ontario to New York and back. The community of Leeds and Grenville really cares about wildlife protection and conservation, and they're really passionate about turtles specifically. And so this project was actually initiated through community concern. Basically, the county kept getting phone calls about turtles on roads, and the public was asking, what are you going to do about it? So the county approached the A2A Road Ecology Committee and basically asked for a study that would identify turtle mortality hotspots and appropriate mitigation measures. So we worked with A2A to secure funding from the county, along with Parks Canada, and formed a diverse project team with members from each of these groups. And I just wanna acknowledge how amazing it is for a municipality to not just support this work, but to also support it financially. So showing some extra cheesy love to Leeds and Grenville. 
So for this study, we took kind of um, a before and after approach. So step one or the before was creating a preliminary geospatial model using pre-existing turtle occurrence records and habitat data to make kind of initial predictions related to turtle mortality risk on county roads. We then conducted field studies to basically ground truth a subsample of county roads to verify those initial model predictions. And then the after part was going back and improving that model using the field findings. So when we analyzed the field data, we got a better understanding of what the main predictors are of turtle presence and mortality on roads, and then use that to tweak the model so that we could apply it to all county roads. So getting into that initial preliminary, preliminary model, uh, we started with some GIS work to get an idea of where turtles are most likely to occur on county roads and where we should target some field surveys. So that included delineating potential turtle habitat areas that intersect with county roads, so areas like wetlands, watercourses, potential nest sites. And then we also compiled a bunch of turtle occurrence data. So some of that was through online sources like GBIF, but then we also initiated an outreach campaign with a bunch of local groups, and we got a ton of turtle data from these organizations here, and special shout out to Fred of Fragile Inheritance. He contributed a ton of turtle data, and you just saw how detailed and thorough his observations are, so that was wonderful, and Fred's been a really important advisor on this project, so thanks, Fred. So with those occurrence data, we acknowledge that they can be biased because they weren't collected in a systematic way. So for example, um, Bishop Mills, where Fred lives, it looks like there's a lot of hot spots there, which there are, but also because Fred is there and he's an awesome naturalist and always collecting turtle data. But for other areas, a lack of occurrence records may not actually mean an absence of turtles. Instead, it could reflect a lack of survey effort in that area. Fred hasn't been there or substantial road mortalities in the past have depressed populations. So we wanted to account for those biases. Um, so in addition to using the turtle occurrence data, we took a separate approach using a least cost path analysis, which basically considers suitable turtle movement corridors in isolation of occurrence data. So you basically assign start and end point, and then it generates a movement pattern across a landscape between those points and it selects habitat type based on values of permeability or resistance that you assign. So here we have three different habitat types that vary in permeability. So you'd imagine that if this little stink pot was trying to move across the landscape, it would have an easier go through this open aquatic habitat compared to a dense forest, compared to a road. But if that road had an underpass, like a bridge or a culvert that would promote safe passage, that would increase permeability. So we accounted for that in our model. So here's just a quick snapshot of what our initial least cost raster looked like. So we have multiple start and destination points across the county. Different colors indicate least cost path, but they correspond to what we expected to be suitable movement corridors for turtles. So to get going on our field studies, we combined the findings of the least cost path analysis and the turtle occurrence data to assign sort of a preliminary mortality risk to county roads. So we have three levels, high, medium, and low. And variation in mortality risk basically reflected whether or not that county road intersected with one of the least cost paths. So one of the squiggly lines on the last map and therefore a suitable movement corridor or whether that area had previous turtle records. And then we selected four sites per risk level to ground truth. So we had a total of 12 field sites and each survey site consisted of a 200 meter long transect that we walked and we used methods that Fred and Carrie Gunson used for a similar study in the area. And then here's just an aerial image showing what one of our transects looks like. So there's a thin red line here, that's the 200 meter transect. You can see there's lots of nice turtle habitat in the area, Charleston Lake and wetland, and then it flows under the road here, the outlet there. And then there's just some photos there of what this site looks like on the ground. 
And really quickly, this is just a rough map showing the distribution of our 12 field sites. So we had four of the low risk sites in green, four medium risk in yellow, and then four of the high risk in red. So for doing our actual walking transects, we started in April of last year and continued them until the end of October 2023. And we went out and surveyed each of those 12 transects twice a week in that period. So Andrea got into the benefits of iNaturalist a little bit, and I can totally preach those as well. So we used iNat to collect our field data, and we've just got a couple of screenshots here. So on the right-hand side, this is what it looks like in the smartphone version of the app when you're uploading an observation to the project. So we had all these different data fields that you could use. And yeah, there's, there's so many benefits to using iNot. Community engagement is a huge one because it's an open platform and basically anybody can contribute. Um, you know, it's a live digital data collection, so no more pen and paper, uh, consistent and required data fields. So people can't miss filling something out, which is nice. And then of course, like promoting collaboration, data sharing and biodiversity research. So I know uh, last CHS conference in Ottawa in the fall, um, Dave Seaburn gave a really good talk that talked about um, assessing map turtle boat injury rates. And basically they didn't have to go out and collect field data. They just used photos and observations from iNaturalist that were publicly available. So pretty cool applications with the data there. So while we were out doing our road surveys, we also documented the presence and characteristics of existing crossing structures, so culverts, bridges, and other existing mitigation measures like the turtle sign. We also ground truth roadside habitat features and documented speed limits and other motorist safety considerations. So things like a blind corner, which could further contribute to collisions. So after the field season, we ran some statistical models to basically assess for habitat suitability and where we're finding turtles on roads. So we used data from our designated transects and then combined that with the turtle occurrence data from all of our friends who contributed to the project. And from that habitat suitability model, we found that the probability of turtle occurrence on county roads was best predicted based on the nearby proportion of marsh habitat, open water or aquatic, aquatic habitat, and thicket swamp habitat. So using that information, we updated our initial leaf cost path analysis, which is shown on the left-hand side here. So we updated the habitat category and the permeability code so that marsh, aquatic, and thicket swamp had their own habitat category and the permeability code reflected highest permeability or lowest resistance in terms of turtle movement across the landscape. We also analyzed whether the presence of an underpass influenced turtle presence on county roads and found that road width at underpass location matters. So turtles were more likely to be found on roads near underpasses when roads were greater than eight meters in width compared to less than eight meters in width. So it's a really specific and kind of odd finding, but that eight meter threshold corresponds with the average width of a single lane county road. So the interpretation could be that, you know, the wider the road you have, the longer the underpass is. And if that underpass is kind of a long, dark, scary tunnel like this one, a turtle might be less likely to use it and may feel more inclined to travel over the road compared to this nice, bright, open underpass under a narrow road. So we accounted for that in our updated leaf cost path analysis. We also updated the start and end points for the leaf cost path analysis. So the original model in the top right here used randomly generated start and end points and then predicted movement between those. But uh, we know that turtles don't necessarily randomly show up on the landscape. So we used what we learned about turtle occurrences and affiliation with certain habitat types and had those start and end points um, be affiliated with marsh and aquatic habitat. So more accurately reflecting where turtles occur on the landscape in this region and probable pathways of dispersal between habitats. So kind of the final step 
for improving our model was combining kind of the two models that I've talked about so far. So the updated least cost path raster and the habitat suitability model. And then we overlaid that onto county roads to predict risk across all roads. And this is what the final product looks like. So here we see turtle road mortality risk across all county roads, red and orange areas being the highest risk. And those road areas intersect with an updated least cost path and have a high prediction rate from the habitat suitability model. So our main recommendation to the county was to prioritize these red and orange areas for mitigation. And in our report, we gave really specific recommendations for the areas that we ground truthed, so those 12 transects, and then gave kind of general advice and guidelines for other areas and basically said, please come and talk to us or other road ecologists on a maintenance basis so that when you go to upgrade those culverts or bridges that sites we didn't check out, we can look at them and give you more site specific and detailed recommendations with the main recommendation being we have to thoughtfully design eco passages and we have to pair those eco passages with fencing. And so, so you could um, wrap it up with just a sentence. Please. Okay, sure. So zipping through, we've got fencing recommendations for them. We had openness ratio recommendations, wider roads, these longer, taller, wider culverts. Uh, eco passages having design features that include specs that benefit more than just turtles, so thinking about terrestrial passage and involving the community through turtle guardian programs, installing nest protectors, that sort of thing, and enhancing all of, you know, talking about the benefits of all the different things that you get from mitigating wildlife vehicle collision. So yeah, sorry, this was a, a very dense version of this talk. It's usually like an hour long. So there's a lot more to this study. Sorry for going over time. Please reach out if you want to connect and have questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Beck, and today I'll be talking about the potential impacts that a crayfish has on Peely Island's endangered salamanders. So the general wisdom of today is that exotic species are harmful, and not for no reason. But is this always true? There we go. The smallmouth salamander, Ambestima texanum, is endangered in Canada. Its Canadian range is restricted to Peely Island and is threatened by habitat loss, road mortality, and the topic of today, invasive species. Enter the White River Crayfish, Procambarus acutus. Native to Southern and Eastern America, it was first found on Peely Island in 2015. They might be impacting the salamanders on Peely Island through consumptive effects like eating their larvae and eggs, which we'd see reflected in a reduced hatch per unit effort. They also might be having non-consumptive effects where they influence the larval salamander behaviors. For example, the salamanders prioritizing vigilance behaviors over foraging, which we then see in a reduced body size. That brings us to the big question then, are White River crayfish having these effects on Gilly Island's salamander larvae. To investigate this, we searched 12 ponds across Peely Island for salamanders using standardized dip netting where we recorded hatch per unit effort and snout vent length. For crayfish, we used baited minnow traps, active searching, we looked for burrows, and we recorded any incidental catches that we found when we were looking for the salamanders. For the consumptive effects, we did a general linear model to see how well the White River crayfish presence predicted changes in catch per unit effort. For the non-consumptive effects, we also included catch per unit effort and water temperature because previous studies have found that these factors have a significant influence on body size. We also included pond identity as a mixed effect to account for the fact that salamanders caught within the same pond wouldn't be independent. So what did we find? For the consumptive effects, we found a significant 
positive correlation between White River crayfish presence and catch per unit effort, which was unexpected. This is possibly due to the fact that the crayfish and salamanders have similar habitat needs. So a pond that can support a lot of one can support a lot of the other. As for the non-consumptive effects, we didn't find any evidence that White River crayfish have a significant effect on body size. But we did find that as population density increased, at per unit effort, uh, individual body size decreased, which agrees with other studies that have found that same negative relationship with density and individual size. So, in conclusion, we didn't find any evidence that White River crayfish are affecting the salamanders in the way that we investigated. And while we remain concerned about other routes through which the crayfish might be affecting the salamanders, it's pretty good to be wrong. We all want the herps to be doing well. And on top of that, we need to use science objectively to understand how exotic species are truly affecting or not affecting the native ecosystems so that we can protect them more effectively. As for next steps, uh, I'm developing a habitat suitability model to compare the habitat preferences of the salamanders and crayfish. And we also need to investigate other methods through which the crayfish could be affecting Keeley Island salamanders. Thank you to the team who helped all of the heavy lifting happen, to the Peter Field naturalists for their generous grant, to Prima Hammer for the positive crayfish identification, and to you for listening. Thanks. And I know I've found salamanders crossing the road in Pelee Island, which was a bit surprising. Do they, and this is very naive of me, do they breed in the same ponds as the salamanders? Or like around the same time? The crayfish you mean, or? Yeah, yeah. Um. The funny thing is, White River crayfish are really understudied. Um, there's a lot we don't know about their life histories. Um, so we're not totally sure when they would breed on Peely Island based on the information that we have around. Uh, so would love to do more studies on that. Well, there we go. More excuses to go to Peely Island. All right. Thank you very <laughs> much.